What's up, H-Town? Welcome to the Believe in Astros podcast, your home for all things Astros, with your hosts, sports writer Jeff Balky and Astros broadcaster and former third baseman Jeff Blob. Now, here's Balky and Blubber. What's up, H-Town? Welcome to episode 30 of the Believe in Astros podcast on the Believe Podcasting Network. I am Jeff Bulky, and with me, as always, my partner Jeff Blum on this very chilly uh, Tuesday morning. Um, and in somehow I'm in a very non-well-lit room today. I'm not sure what happened to my lighting, but we'll all survive. <laughs> Hopefully you're only listening and not watching this on YouTube. Uh, yeah, you can well, find us on Spotify. Houston, tur- Houston turned into Seattle all of a sudden, man. I know, it was especially <laughs> yesterday. My goodness. Yeah. Today it's beautiful, but I don't want to be on the golf course today. Um, no. It's a, a little chilly for that. Uh, you can find us on Spotify, Apple, Stitcher, and of course YouTube. Be sure to like and subscribe. Uh, Blummer, you were uh, speaking of golf. You were out at the old. Uh, is it the? Is it still called the Houston Open, or is it now? It's. I know oh, it's yeah. got a spot. There it is, Houston Open. Nice. Oh, yeah. No, they've got a Showing great logo. T-shirt. Yeah, Cadence Bank was a sponsor. It was a blast over the weekend. You had that tiny microphone going, which was oh. excellent. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you go to the Cadence Bank Houston Open Instagram and Twitter feeds, yeah, you'll find quick 30 second videos where I was chasing people around with this itty bitty microphone. <laughs> Asking people to do their best shooter McGavin. Yeah. <laughs> I saw that. That was pretty good. What's your best golf? Okay. We should ask you, what is your favorite golf movie? Uh, you know what's crazy? Legend of Bagger Vance, for whatever, I don't it's know if great, I'm sentimental, emotional, whatever it is. Movie. I mean, obviously, the Caddyshacks and the Happy Gilmores give me a great laugh, and I can quote them mm-hmm. for days. But at the same time, if Legend of Bagger Vance is on, for some reason, I watch it. it you know, it just sucks me in every single time. That's a tremendous movie. I love that movie. I I, I might put in my two cents for Tin Cup just because I think it's yeah. a... There's nothing better than that than that where he keeps hitting the same shot mm-hmm. over and over and keeps missing. Um, but yeah, I'm with you. I think Bagger <laughs> Vance is a really good. I think very underrated, probably yeah. because it is a little sentimental. It's the same vibe as like um, uh, the Natural, something like yeah, that. It's got exactly. that same kind of same kind of vibe. I'm with you on that. All right, a word for our sponsor, Bet Online. Uh, basketball is back. Bet Online remains your number one source for all sports betting needs this season. Again, um, if you're going over under for the Rockets this year, which is set at 23 and a half, I might consider the under at this point. Just saying. <laughs> uh, when the Texans and, and Rockets have combined for three wins, that's probably not a good sign. Speaking of over under, don't take the Texans for more than about three or four wins either. Uh, you'll always find the latest odds, team matchup info, player news, and game trends at Bet Online. And as your continued source for all sports wagering information, Bet Online features. Live betting, free contests, and giveaways all season long. Always the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports and events, whether that's NFL, NBA, NHL, MMA, tennis, boxing, or golf. Head to betonline.ag to join and receive your 50% welcome bonus with your first deposit. Make sure to use promo code BLEAV to receive your rewards. Bet online where the game starts. All right, Blummer, let's get right into this. James Click out as GM, along with Scott Powers, the assistant. Uh, right now, it's Bill Ferkus and Charles Cook who were promoted alongside Andrew Ball to be the assistant GMs. Um, who's running the show right now? I mean, I know Jim Crane is the obvious answer to that, but I mean, they have no GM and they're getting ready to head into the winter meetings. Uh, something's got to break soon, right? Yeah, the timing of this whole thing is crazy because you had James Click at the GM meetings right after the World Series. He, he was doing his best to put on a good face and answer these questions as, as well as he could, uh, considering he maybe knew what was coming. Yeah. He was offered a one-year deal, from what I hear, a considerable increase in pay. But at the same time, he wanted a little more security for his family, which mm-hmm. you can't argue with. But uh, they're obviously... There is more to this story than we are being told. James Click turned down the one-year deal. He has been uh, let go, so to speak. And uh, now you've got uh, a couple of different people out there. I think Bill Ferkus is the lead right now if they are negotiating some of these contracts. Jim Crane is on his way to the owners' meetings. And uh, 
I think when he gets back from that and you start to see these winter meetings is where you start you, you start to see some of the movement maybe if they have guys that they're targeting to interview and possibly have in this organization. And I think what's really interesting about this entire situation is, is if you go back to when James Click was first hired, there may have been a limited talent pool for him to draw from because of the, the scandal, the way that Rob Manfred ha handled everything. So he was kind of he wasn't forced into James Click, but he was forced to make a quick decision. Yeah, it didn't work out. This is going to be a little bit different because now you have a team that just won its second World Series, is prepared to compete again in the American League for the championship to go to the World Series, and now you might get a little more interest from guys around the league who might say, or or women. There's plenty of women being hired. Miami's Absolutely. doing a great job, but there might be a little more of an opportunity or a larger talent pool to draw from. So I'm kind of curious to see who comes in for that interview. Yeah, I am too. I know there's been some talk that maybe some of the GMs are a little upset about how this all went down. Some of them are a little feeling a little butthurt about it, which is whatever. Um, click, you know, I, I had an old boss who used to say uh, when somebody would leave that he, they quit, got fired. And I feel like that's the kind of the circumstance here. Well, he was sort of quit, sort of got fired. There was sort of just a, I, I think you're right. I think there was a limited pool to, to pull from. Jim Crane had to make a quick decision. The truth is, is that it's not click as he has not been a bad GM. He hasn't been a good GM either. He's just been fine. And, mm -hmm. um, but when you're somebody like Crane, who's very, obviously a very demanding guy, a very exacting guy, a guy who's very involved in the baseball operations because he himself feels like he knows a lot about the game, mm -hmm. um, then you're going to have to be somebody who's going to be able to handle that. And Luna obviously was that type of guy. I just wonder who's going to be on their GM search radar at this yeah. point. You know, I mean, I know that like a lot of, we've talked about the David Stearns and, um, wait, David Stearns. Is that right? Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Cause I know, I, it well, sounds he, like the old NBA commission. Exactly. David Stern, not da <laughs> David Stern's, not David Stern. No, uh. that's the difference between this. David Stern uh, is passed away a couple of years ago. David Stern is with the Brewers. Um, I know we've talked about that. He has said he's staying put. I've heard, I've read that the Mets are interested in possibly trying to, to go after him as well. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be real. interesting. Do you are, are any thoughts on on where they might go with this, or is oh, it just man. kind of up in the air at this point? It is, and I think there, you know, it could be. David Stearns obviously carries a little more name equity or experience just because he came up with the Astros in the Jeff yeah. Luno era and then moved on to the Milwaukee Brewers really quickly to get the opportunity to become a GM of the Milwaukee Brewers. Did a great job over there, um, you know, even though he was demoted, I think, to president of baseball ops or whatever he is now. But his yeah. contract is through 2023, and the Milwaukee Brewers have yet to release him from that contract or release him to let him go interview for other jobs. So that's kind of where he stands. But he's he he's kind of that first experience choice. He's got experience inside the Astros organization. Obviously has that relationship with Jim Crane, but at the same time, you know, you start looking around at some of these assistant GMs and some of these other guys around the league and, you know, some, some names might start to pop up a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I think if you are a GM who's interested in a job, you come into a great situation. Uh, granted, it may not be the team that you have built, but you're kind of at the, not, I don't want to say the back end, but you're kind of at a, at a, at a point in the Astros organization where you could start to put your handprint and, and put oh, yeah. your name on some of these guys yeah. where you're drafting and calling up and, 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 you know, trading or bringing in as free agents. That's where you kind of look to see as a young GM, how can I put my imprint on this organization? There might be some opportunities here in Houston, but at the same time, if you move into Houston, you kind of go... What's going on? How do I not screw this up? Yeah, I, for me, it feels like with Crane, you need somebody who's going to be an aggressive kind of go-getter because that's kind that's of That's a really good point. I, no. I, it feels like you need somebody Jim says, who's I want something. You might, you might want to go get it for him. <laughs> exactly. And I feel like he's the type of guy, like I, I've always thought James Click was a nice guy, but he never struck me as somebody who was a very intense sort of type a personality. And yeah. I feel like for somebody like Jim Crane, you might need somebody like that. Um, he just mm -hmm. strikes me as that type of guy who's, he's the type of guy. I remember a number of years ago where 
uh, one of the guys, a colleague of mine who had been writing, had written some stuff about the Astros they didn't like, and they sort of summoned him directly into Jim Crane's office to have a discussion <laughs> about it. I'm like, that's that's kind of who he is, you know. And of course, the, he didn't. He was like, listen, I write what I write, but um, mm-hmm. I do think that he's got that personality, and he he reminds me actually a little bit of Les Alexander, the uh, Rockets' former owner. Um, very exacting, uh, very specific in what he wants, and and you know he, he should get it. He's the owner. That's the deal. Yeah, but to Jim's credit, he'll have the conversation too. Like you're saying, he's not going to sit there and have all this innuendo floating around. He's going to no. say, "Oh, you said something. Bring it in. Let's have this conversation. If you can get, convince me otherwise, I'll go with it." But Jim does a good job of actually handling handling those conversations face to face. He he expects to win. He has a great idea about the game, having played it for as long as he did in his life. And I think he also likes the idea of winning and the way that this city has treated this ball club with season tickets, merch sales, um, everything that goes into owning a baseball team. This city has given Jim the opportunity to have a great team and have a huge payroll. And what I love about Jim is he recognizes that and wants to give it back to the fans. And -hmm. that's where I think, you know, he was with James Click. And like you said, James is a, it might be, I don't know if he is, but I know he's a brilliant mind because I've had conversations with Mm -hmm. him about scouting. He brought a lot of these uh, scouts back, which I Mm -hmm. enjoyed because you do need eyes on these guys. But he just didn't have that 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 killer instinct to go out there and make that gutsy move. You know, that gunslinger, the old, you know, rest in peace, Kevin Towers, that Kevin Towers right. idea of, okay, we're going to go get that guy. I'm not going to think about it. We're going to make the move and we're going to see what happens kind of thing. Yeah, I agree with you. I think that's and I think that's what Jim Crane wants, which makes sense. And uh, But on, on one positive note, Joe Espada, uh, bench coach, oh, is man. back, which is Omar great. Too. I, You know, honestly, let's let's. I, Espada, it's potentially he's like the, he could be the heir apparent. I mean, he had he's had interviews with other teams. Um, he's obviously been great, especially for the infield. I mean, you see what he did with Jeremy Pena and and how much he changed Yuli Gurriel as a first baseman. I mean, the Astros had multiple uh, Gold Glove Award winners in the you know in the infield, so he's been great with that. Um, seems like a really good guy to get back to help with you know dusty with another season yeah this is where i get a little biased because i am a huge joe espada fan when aj hinch brought him in as the bench coach this is when i got to know joe a little bit better hanging around the ball club and talking to him but what an unbelievable mind and what a his ability to adapt to situations, you've got to remember that Joe comes from Miami, where a team that was really young, struggled, had to go out there and play good baseball in order to win. He <laughs> taught them how to do that. Then he moves to New York, and he's, he's their third base coach uh, you know, for the, for the New York Yankees on the biggest stage on the planet, competing up there, taking them to, to uh, the playoffs and things like that as a third base coach. So he's got a lot of varied experience as far as coaching is concerned. And then A.J. brought him in as that bench coach, and now he's the bench coach for Dusty Baker. And I think one of the quotes that Dusty had when he re-signed was, you know, I get to do a lot of talking, a lot of in-game, uh, you know, strategics and ideas and things like that. But all of the heavy lifting is with my coaches. And Joe Espada is that guy that has a work ethic like I've never seen because he works so well with these guys. But I, I love the fact that he's bilingual. So the manager is usually the guy that's out front. You know, he's the front man of the band, speaks to the media, uh, usually has the cameras on him. But you need that bench coach that is willing to be the bad guy every once in a while. You need that bench coach that's willing to go down there and give guys some good, good advice or maybe reprimand them a little bit. And Joe is that mm-hmm. guy. Joe is a wonderful communicator, uh, like I said, bilingual, so he, he, he adapts to the uh, Latin players in there, then the, um, the English-speaking players, and he's garnered a lot of respect. But to your point, he's got a, a couple of gold glove shortstops in Carlos mm-hmm. Correa and Jeremy Pena, and he, his, his reputation is great, but he is a highly, highly valued in that dugout, both to us as fans and as, you know, as media members and also as a uh, guy who's in that dugout fighting for his players. Yeah, he's. I think it's just a great. I don't. I've never had a chance to interview him, but uh, he. Everything that I've heard about him is just that he is absolutely fantastic at keeping a tight lid on that uh, on that clubhouse and in that dugout, um, and that he's one of the you know guys that really helps keep that whole thing together. Um, that I had I had read this a while back that he's sort of the glue guy that helps bridge the gap between 
the Latin American players and the guys from the United States, giving them sort of, you know, help. Because it, it, it would seem natural for players, especially if you speak a different language, to sort of form their own sort of like little groups. And I'm sure they do anyway. But mm -hmm. that's, a good, that's a good way to break up a clubhouse um, if you don't have everybody working at the sa on the same page. And so I, I've heard that he's a guy that really helps to bridge that gap. And, and Alex Bregman, interestingly enough, yeah, because Bregman learned how to speak Spanish. So I, I think that's so important in a, on a team that has such incredible chemistry like this one. And the fact that he's been able to span multiple managers is kind of a big deal, really. Yeah, and I hope he is the heir apparent because, like you said earlier, that he is interviewed for so many jobs, hasn't been mm -hmm. able to qualify to get that job to move on. But the idea of Joe Espada as a manager doesn't scare me at all. And if it happens oh, no. to be here in Houston, I think it's even better for us. I think he'll be a big league manager sooner rather than later. We'll yeah. see. Um, speaking of coming back, neither of us really expected Rafael Montero to be the first guy back <laughs> for the yeah. Astros. I mean, I was convinced... I, in my head, I was like, somebody is just going to back up the Brinks truck and dump a whole boatload of money on top of him. And I'm not saying three years, $34 million isn't oh, decent he got cash. Paid. <laughs> he got paid. But I was surprised that it was the Astros. Were you as surprised as I was? Yeah, no, I was because we talked about it. I don't know if it was the you know the, the just after the World Series we were yeah. talking about Brian Abreu and how brilliant he was and really kind of broke out of that shell this year. Chart started to show you know he already had the stuff to be a back end of the bullpen type guy, but really showed the mentality in high pressure situations to come out and really shut the door and get his t offense back up there. And the reason I brought that up, or we brought that up, is because. Rafael Montero was that free agent. So if you did lose him to somebody, who could you plug into that situation? Right. It would be Brian Abreu. But give the Astros credit. They recognize that pitching wins championships, and they've probably got one of the better rotations, uh, even with or without Justin Verlander. Right. And now you add the back end of the bullpen. And I think we're starting to see how important bullpens can be throughout the course oh. of the season, and especially in the postseason. So they did back it up for him, 11 plus million per year for three years. I, I'm 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 a Rafael Montero fan. He looked like he was having a good time in that bullpen, and who doesn't like winning? So hey, man, the, the <laughs> pay right. and the winning kind of go hand in hand, and Rafael Montero's in a great spot. And you almost feel like I think Presley has one more season left on his deal. You almost feel like. Could Montero yeah. then eventually slide into the closer role? Uh, you know, after that, it's not a, it could not, make not it could make some sense. Yeah, it could yeah, make some it's sense. A good call. And, and I think too, just any kind of depth in in the bullpen is just like you said. The bullpen is. Yeah. It, this is these are no longer the days of guys going eight nine innings. You know, this is a the, you preserve so your true. pitching staff by letting them throw quality <clears throat> starts and then getting them the hell out of there and trusting your bullpen. And when you have the embarrassment of riches the Astros have both in their rotation and in their bullpen, then, you know, you can do things like this. And, I mean, you know, it's good to be the king sometimes, <laughs> you oh, know. Oh, man. Yeah. I can't, I can't wait for people to start writing books or, or, you know, books or whatever it is about, you know, the, the rotation in the bullpen to pitch as well as they did in the regular season in 2022 and then complete the, the task of getting through the World Series was mm. – Dude, it might be one of the best pitching staffs ever if you start looking hey, at the numbers. Yeah, you've got to you've got to figure somebody's eventually some nerd out there is going to really nerd out and yeah, some and some everything. number's going to pop out and they're going to go, "What the? Are you kidding me?" Yeah, yeah. somebody <laughs> somebody's going to be like, "It's going to be like the thing where the numbers are just kind of coming at them through the air." It's yeah, like beautiful suddenly, mind. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They're writing stuff on bulletin boards or on uh, chalkboards. Um, so, last thing before we go, Ken Rosenthal had his. Uh, write up today about what he feels like or you know what he's hearing around the major leagues he mentioned that that verlander hasn't really gotten a, a deal yet from the astros which surprised him doesn't really surprise me i think they're going to let him poke around in free agency and see what kind of money he can get but the interesting one was he said the astros have identified anthony rizzo as yeah. their number one target at first base now you and i talked about first base we talked about uh abreu in chicago um, talked about Josh Bell, uh, both of them free agents. Anthony Rizzo is a really interesting one because it, it, not only would you get a very good first baseman and a lefty mm -hmm. bat, which I think are both you know important aspects of the Astros offseason, but you get to take somebody away from the Yankees, which cannot hurt. 
Um, what do you think about the Rizzo possibility? I think it's very intriguing for so many different reasons. And let's just take on the field, for instance. You've got Yuli, 38, 39 years old. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll get into him at the back end of this because I've got some thoughts about keeping Yuli on the team and still being able to sign a guy like Anthony Rizzo because, mm -hmm. like you said, Rizzo, very good defensively. It, it, he looks like a very good clubhouse guy and has played for championship teams. He's played under you know a, a lot of scrutiny and pressure in New York. And I'm wondering if he was, kind of went to New York saying, man, this is going to be a great spot. I would love to play in this stadium, play under this uh, kind of scrutiny and, and uh, excitement, and kind of realize that, man, that was fun. I want to go do what those guys are doing. I want to be on that team. Because right. that team looks like they have one thing on their mind, which is going out and winning every game they possibly can. That being said, could you imagine his bat in that lineup? Oh, man. I mean, he would have to maybe take a little bit of humble pie and maybe hit sixth or seventh in that lineup, but he would drive in 75 to 100 if he goes out and puts together at bats like he can. And his at bats in that lineup for the Houston Astros would absolutely destroy starting pitching on a regular basis because the number of pitches this guy can see, fight off, and then eventually hit hard would really give him a real opportunity. And again, it, the expectation would be there to produce, but you're in a lineup where you've got massive amount of protection up and down this lineup. So you could go out there and maybe scuffle a little bit before you figure it out. Uh, I think it's a great fit. And getting back to Yuli, why not turn Yuli into that utility guy? He may not be yeah. able to play that outfield position as often as you want, but he could go out there and be a serviceable, you know, couple inning guy or you know, pick up a guy if he's hurt, but the guy can play third. He could play second base, obviously mm -hmm. plays a very good first base, but it would give you a lefty righty matchup too with Anthony Rizzo. Mm -hmm. If Rizzo's having a tough time against a particular lefty, guess who I bring in? Mm -hmm. Yuli Gurriel and you don't lose much. Um, and you know, that's, that's kind of where I stand with Anthony Rizzo. I think it's a very intriguing opportunity to bring that guy in. Yeah. I, I, I think that would be a huge maneuver for the Astros because, again, you're getting all of the things that you really want. You're you're keeping this the defense at first base that Yuli has been so good at. You're putting a guy in the lineup with a lefty bat that has power. Um, you're also putting a lefty bat in a guy who tends to pull when they're taking away the shift. Mm -hmm. And so you're giving you're giving a guy who can hit left-handed another opportunity. Um, and then when you look at it too, Rizzo's a guy who can DH some. You know, yeah. you can swap him around and let him DH, and it, it's another flexible piece. And that's another thing I think the Astros have done uh, that's not been talked about enough, and that is they have really played to flexibility. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. They have a number of guys on this team that can play different positions. Now, they're not going to move Jeremy Pena and Jose Altuve around and Alex Bregman and stuff like that, but they have guys on this team who can move around in the outfield, who can DH a bit, who can, you know, and they give guys rest that way. And I think mm -hmm. that's something that, that uh, the Astros have been very good at. And, boy, Rizzo, can you imagine how good that bat would look in the lineup come postseason? Yeah. And you I know mean, what? Something ridiculous. something that I think will be talked about with GMs when they're signing guys, why not sign another left-handed hitter when the shift is going away? Exactly. No shift. I mean, the rules are going to be fascinating next year. I'm yeah. dying. I'm I'm actually so excited about getting to spring training for no other reason than to watch how crazy the pitch clock is going to make things. <laughs> I cannot wait <laughs> to see some of the insanity that is going to come, that is going to come into play with that pitch clock. I mean, it's not going to happen oh, all yeah. the time, but there are going to be moments where guys are going to be scrambling with the, oh, <laughs> with the pitchers are going to be scrambling. I don't know if you've heard this, but I heard something that hitters have to be in the box within eight seconds. Yes. I heard that. I, that's, that's insane. I, that's a tiny little rule that nobody really that, I think mentioned. that might be the bigger impact. Well, you know, I, who is it that so my, my, uh, I think it's my brother-in-law was talking about how, or no, it's my friend, Frank. He always, he can tell exactly what everybody's going to do when they get in the box. He's got their routines down. <laughs> he's got their my, routines he, down. He's got their routines down. What about down. Kyle he's Tucker? Like, that, that's it. That's the one I'm thinking of. Yeah. He's got to rub his hands. Doesn't together. even have batting gloves, then, and he takes he's forever. Got to, no, he's got to <laughs> kick the thing like three or four times in a row Wipe just to get it. Ex bat. Just get it exactly right. It's like yeah. he's like yeah, I, I know. I'm wondering how it's not. That was not eight seconds. I mean, somebody's. Mm -mm. I that's. I'm I'm looking forward to that chaos. I'll be honest with you. 
Um, yeah. That's going to be super fun. All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Blummer, any final thoughts? We, we're going to be back on Friday. Um, what you got going this week? Anything exciting? Oh, no, nothing. I actually have nothing, and I might be looking forward to it. It's crazy. Uh, you know, the the World Series went right into the Houston Open. Couldn't yes. could barely take a breather. Uh, my wife had a gala for her charity, and then oh, this wow. weekend, uh, I think Friday night, we actually have the Astros uh, Black Tie Gala, which will be a, a lot of fun. So that may be the only thing yes. that I'm looking forward to. And my daughter's coming home next weekend for hey. Thanksgiving break. So just oh. a little personal note that uh, we're going to get the family unit back together. But uh, That's great. I, can, I continue to, to uh, look forward to being on with you and doing this podcast, man. It's been going really good, and I can't thank the fans enough. I was in an event last night that we did. Uh, TK and Jim and I actually, we had an event last night that we went to and I had several people come up to me and go, Hey man, that podcast is going really good. So credit <laughs> to you, awesome. Balky, for making this happen. Hey, thanks man. I I've appreciated it too. It's really been fun. I, I, you know, I've, I'd done a little bit of podcasting, a little bit of radio and stuff before, but this is the most enjoyable for sure by far with a bull. And, and I, you know, can't thank people enough for listening. I've gotten so much good feedback from people. I, I was at a funeral this weekend um, not the most happy place to be, obviously, but yet I had multiple people come up to me and say, "Hey, really good podcast." <laughs> I'm thinking, wow. "All right, that's that'll cheer me up a little bit," you know. There and you and I feel like there's there's been really and and of course anybody who's listening, you know, thank you so much for listening and and yes. subscribing. It's it's fantastic to have you. We're going to be obviously churning this thing out all off season. There's going to be a lot of crazy stuff happen this off season simply because it's so short. You know, the Astros have the shortest offseason. It's, it's incredibly Astros, abbreviated. You are correct. Yeah, the, the Astros are going to heat up quick. Right. The Astros and Phillies have a short, uh, short mm-hmm. offseason. And so before you know it, I mean, look, February pitchers and catchers are going to start reporting, and that's not that far off. So there's going to be a, a very steep and quick heating up of the hot stove, as, as you mentioned, Blummer. And so just, yeah, stick with us and, and keep listening. Stay tuned. And, Stay tuned. <laughs> Thanks so much to our uh, to our uh, uh, sponsor, uh, Bet Online, and obviously like and subscribe and keep hanging in there with us. We will be back on Friday. Thanks so much. Go Astros. <laughs>